What can we learn from a yoga master who's been teaching hundreds of thousands of people for more than 50 years? He's turning London upside down this weekend. He's hosting a world record event called Headstand for Peace, and he is Sri Dharma Mitra. I have the privilege of having yet another conversation with him during his tour to London this weekend. Let's go and see what he has to say. Pranams, Sri Dharma Mitraji. Very, very lovely to see you again today. Thank you for having me here. It is a great pleasure to me. And, and a real honor for, for me too, because we did this two years ago. We spoke, and to have this opportunity, this satsang, one more time, it's a real privilege. Thank you very much. And I know that you are here this weekend for a special event. You're going to be hosting a world record event, right? The Headstand for Peace. So um, that's really interesting to me to understand. Now, what does peace look like for you? What would peace look like for you? And what specific and measurable results would you like to see from doing this event? Well, <coughs> peace looks like to me when we are in harmony, when we love each other. And these meetings like this, headstand, is, is one way to get us together. And then our thoughts get together. And then with our thoughts, we may change the world. So headstand also stimulate the glands in the base of the brain, especially pituitary gland. And then some astral senses of perception will be available for us. We are able, after a good compassion is cultivated, we are able to sense subtle things, spiritual things, or to sense the forces, or God, they say. So we become sensitive for subtle things. So peace means to become more respectful, reverent, compassionate to each other. So by gathering together and doing something very, it is fun to do headstand. But the purpose is just to get us together with good spiritual enthusiasm. We can practice the headstand and get healthier and it will build up some peace inside and then it generates spread through everywhere. And uh, is that why the um, headstand is called the king of asanas? The headstand is the king of asanas because of the amazing benefits physical and mental. It brings radiant health. It brings mental power, good memory, sharpness of mind, and also it stimulates the sixth sense. Pituitary gland is the sixth sense, and then gradually we'll be able to activate it and help and headstand. It is a great help. It is amazing. So can anyone do the headstand, providing that they're healthy? Can anyone do the headstand and how long should they do it for if they, if they practice it regularly? And how many times a week should, ideally, should they practice to have the benefits? Well, all these are according to the conditions of the practitioners. If you are in good health, not in good health, but healthy enough to stand on your head, you should increase the length of time gradually. Let's say every week you add one minute. If you have time, you can practice it once a day. I usually sometimes do it two or three times a day. 
but you have to increase it gradually. Now, if you are not in good health, eating too much junk food, you have to watch out. And then you may, the headstand may injure yourself. You should find a qualified teacher who will gradually teach you the easier variations of headstand where the blood pressure is not too much in the head. But you can do it as much as you can. But be careful if you are not in good condition. You must have the advice from your doctor or from a nice yoga teacher. It demands no flexibility. Everyone can do it. Elephants love it. <laughs> they stand on the nose instead of the head. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, you said you practiced it three times a day sometimes? Yes, I do practice sometimes three times a day. And sometimes I have family, I have uh, granddaughters and children too. And sometimes I just show some of the headstand. And I do headstand even with my pets, with the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Every class I do, I am doing headstand before the class. So I do it constantly. Awesome. Yeah. Wow. Now, I know that you've said, um, I've read a quote from you somewhere, and you've said that um, yoga without yama is like spaghetti without sauce. Can you please explain this, why this is so? Most religion has have the ethical rules, right? The commandments. Let's say without the ethical rules, there is no kingdom of God. The mind will never fit for meditation. Because if compassion, the ethical rules are not, observed, for some reason, people cannot feel the presence of subtle things. You have to believe, you don't feel, you understand? So the ethical rules is amazing, especially compassion. Compassion, what is the action of compassion? To see yourself in others, to place yourself in others. That is the first step of self-realization, to see yourself in others. So, without the ethical rules, you cannot sense a spiritual thing. And then you have no choice to believe. Believe is not enough. If you sense them, you become more enthusiastic about it. And then you'll be able to practice it. You'll be able to follow the teacher, to follow the scriptures. You have more, how to say, you can sense the presence of reality. Compassion is amazing, the ethical rules. It develops in you, the practitioner, the ability, some of the psych powers, the ability to see what is real, what is not real. And then when you have this ability, you, if you see someone that you feel it is real, automatically you develop that enthusiasm and then you'll be able to practice it. You'll be able to, how to say, to reflect upon it, and then gradually, realization. It's like an expression, it becomes an expression. Yeah, you want to find out how civilized we are here in this planet? The way we treat the animals and eat. <laughs> we must become ethically civilized, and then you'll be able to succeed in your religion, whatever you want to. So it's, it's developing the inner, what we call the bhava, the bhav of, rather than just believing something, you're actually 
sensing it within your own inner being. If it's a feeling, it's a, it's a real um, arising that be within your own self. So it's more than a belief, it's, it becomes like an expression eventually. But we call that bhava in Sanskrit. Is that, is that what you mean? Well, with compassion being observed automatically, it manifests in you. It shines through your gate, through your senses. You can see when you said, this man, he is a good man, just by looking by his, his movement, his eyes, we can almost sense his good qualities. So it expressed through the gates, it shines out. Have you ever committed a niyam, um, meaning that you have made up your mind to do something, really, like a, a big commitment? And uh, maybe some aspect of your life, you've wanted to alter it, change it, and then you found that um, you failed really badly, you failed abysmally. If so, what was that? And how did you um, go about finally succeeding in it? Well, niyama is part of the foundation of yoga too. Without it, no enlightenment. Without surrender to the Lord, knowledge of the self, and in order to achieve that, what? Purity, contentment is the other step of niyama. And also self-control. I always promise myself, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do can, uh, eating, eating candy anymore. And then next week I am eating candy and breaking all the rules. <laughs> and then I run to my guru crying, I could not follow you. He, he said, don't worry about it, just keep trying. You stand up and keep trying and trying. When the time comes, automatically you'll be able to succeed. But the failure is part of the process. I fell many times, you know, trying to keep purity. I could not maintain purity. Even nowadays, I'm still going around controlling my diet. I cannot resist a piece of chocolate occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> So, the secret to succeed, keep repeating and understanding that the cause why you are losing control is due to your previous actions, you know, your habits from the past that torment us, but they come to an end. You know, you just keep trying and waiting, never get angry. Keep trying and trying, never give up, try and try. When the time comes, you overcome. Even the wise man has to be alert all the time because temptations are everywhere with technology today. So it's good to know that you're a chocoholic like me. <laughs> you enjoy chocolate sweets, yes, good. Um, Another question I have for you is, what has been the hardest part of your yoga sadhana, and why? I think my hardest part of yoga is to control the mouth, the food. It's so difficult. <laughs> <laughs> not for me, it's for the mind and the body. I already realize I'm not the body and the mind. But I keep trying. I don't make it too difficult. You know, once a week, I am always free to eat a vegan pizza. <laughs> but I have the, the punishment for that. Next day, maybe I have to go just on watermelon yeah. to clean the system. Right. So, I'm not too strict. I'm not even a totally vegan. Because when I touch a piece of chocolate, maybe once a, a month, I know there is a few drops of milk there. <laughs> so I just don't worry too much. I try to do my best. 
Der Fall Jaron Karma Jaron Dharma. I think um, uh, because we're talking about food and you know the difficulty of resisting temptation, um, I think people would love to know what would you say is your normal diet? What, what on, a, on, a, on, a, on a daily basis, let's say, what does um, Sri Dharma's uh, meals? What do they look like? What? Okay. What? Well, I usually, I became a little lazy for, to make juices now. <laughs> I usually buy stores or wait for the student to bring to me. But I, I drink lots of protein drinks that are available, especially in New York City. There's a meal replacement. Yeah, this protein drink is a meal replacement. You don't have to worry about anything. It doesn't leave waste inside anything. Most is liquid. But I, most of my food are most uh, smooth, you know, coconut water. I don't drink much water. I go months without water. But I drink other things. <laughs> I wish God put some sugar in the water. And then I'll bring, I'll drink more water. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you drink coconut water. But the same yeah. way, I sometimes eat avocados. And sometimes, I love pasta once in three months. Yeah. If someone brings me a vegan pasta, oh, I enjoy, but in moderation. So, I'll keep more into the vegan as much as possible. I don't cook too much the food, most raw. Mm -hmm. right. My guru said, cook, said to me, cook your food here, this is your pot. <laughs> so, but I love cooked food. <laughs> yeah, don't we, don't we all? Such a big temptation. I know you've said, um, we are the nectar of intelligence beyond all conditions. What do you see is our biggest barrier to realizing this aspect of ourselves, this nectar of intelligence that you say that we are? What's the biggest barrier to realizing this for us? This is a really difficult to explain, but I'll give you an example. Let's say before one of the big bangs, <laughs> or before the, well, the big bangs, there are many, the scientists now discover this big bang. All this that we see here is just like one grain of sand in the, all the beaches on the planet. That means infinite. But anyway, let's say before the big bang, before duality, before vibration, before even intelligence start coming, how can you explain that? For the mind, you're going to end up in void. Yes. So we must, let's say, it's not easy for the mind to understand, but you may grasp the understanding. So we are, uh, one way for the mind to understand, the witness of our activities. Remember the witness, in order to be a witness, we need senses of perception to witness. So the senses of perception need consciousness. So before, behind consciousness, life, the nectar of intelligence. So only when you reach, let's say, you're self-realized, you'll be able to grasp the understanding that the non-duality is reality. It never changes, it never moves, is eternal, never subject to time. It's like God. In another word, we are like space. Everything is inside the space. And there are millions of big bangs take place there, but the space are not affected. Yeah. But everyone needs the space. Yeah. Everyone needs the space. They are consciousness, God. So it's beyond duality. If you keep compassion properly, you'll be able to 
go, start accepting non-duality. <laughs> right, so it's it, the, the fact that we, we don't have, um, we need to develop, I think what you're saying is we need to develop our own uh, inner perception to be able to become more and more a witness to who we, in, to our inner nature, to the, in, to the consciousness that we are, the wider non-local consciousness that we are. That's the access to being able to experience this, in, this intelligent aspect of ourselves. So as Pantajal, Patanjali says, yoga is the settling of the mind into silence. As we keep our diet properly, do some poses in order to get healthy, and then gradually we become self-controlled, we are able to be without activities. We first stop all the physical activities and gradually the mental activities and then one is going into the samadhi, the many stages. By the last samadhi, from that, that you'll be able to have some evidence, but you put your head out, but don't put all the way out, otherwise you disappear. But at least you realize, that's it. I am one with God. <laughs> you understand? Only God exists. Many scripture declares only God exists. One without a second. <laughs> Another example. I like technology. Everyone, everything is like a cell phone set. And this, everyone needs the signal, right? <laughs> if the cell phone are here, not the signal, God consciousness is always there. When you put your cell phone off, it means you're going deep sleep, void. And then you're going to say, where is myself? Yeah. Well, your ego, your personal thing, is off. That's why it's void. But we are the signal to the God. Everyone has to be swimming God. <laughs>
you can achieve yoga without the postures. Yeah. So, yeah, postures are not yoga, it's a preparation. Yeah. But if you're fit, your body's fit to do it, you're wishing to master all the poses, and then you have to become more self-disciplined and find the right environment near others, near those who are had mastered it. Right? And be careful also, you, some people have conditions from the past. According to your body and conditions, you can never do some poses. Like I know myself, I cannot do many of the poses because due to my condition I born, that's it. <laughs> I can't do it. But I know it's not important. But it's so much fun. So much fun to do. <laughs> um, another question that I have is, um, what is your vision of how the world is and how it will move forward? What, do you, what is your view on where the world is right now and how it will move forward? Well, our planet, everything is evol evolving for better. Little by little, we become more and more ethically civilized, we become, you know, good and nice to each other. And very soon, we don't need Yama anymore. And technology with Google, Swami Gugananda, online, <laughs> you can get all the scriptures. Yeah, you have all the answers. Swami Gugananda is better than my guru. When I ask something, my guru, he takes a long time to answer me. <laughs> you have to do more, three more years of karma yoga. But Gugananda, before you finish typing your, your, question, your question, he already have all the answers. <laughs> so gradually, with technology, yoga will become more and more say, comfortable to practice but of course more temptation. But very soon we don't need niyama or yama anymore. And very soon in the future, no need too much asanas. Since we are eating, become vegan, eating correctly, and without doubt, everybody's calm in peace. And then eventually we don't need not even yoga, only the last two steps. Very, very interesting. If you have just one single advice for the dedicated yogis, what would that be? That would be concerning about compassion. Please learn how to see yourself in others, how to place yourself in others. That is the first step of yoga. <laughs> Without that, no self-realization, no compassion, no harmony, anything. See yourself in others. You learn that with your loved one, with your son. When your son is suffering, you quickly you place yourself there, right? So try to do it in all beings, even in those that hate you, but keep the distance. Really excellent, really excellent advice. And finally, how do you source yourself to remain inspired? Actually, is the beautiful things that yoga, self-realization promise, that we are one with God. We are one portion of God. We are eternal. Right? And also, I just found out lately, for the past few years, the meaning of life, what is ahead of us. I realized that after self-realization is not the end, it's the beginning. Yes. It's the end of pain and suffering, but we have amazing things ahead. Infinite. It's infinite. 
So that keeps me alive and content. <laughs> of course, I keep the laws of karma. No matter what happened, I am always content because I know there is a reason why it is happening. It's my own fault. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you very, very much. That's very inspiring indeed. I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you're really busy this weekend, but thank you so much. Mm -hmm.